Thanks, Scott. To put the Eastern Cape in perspective, it's the second largest province in South Africa, with an area spanning over 160,000 square kilometres, which makes the region as diverse as it is scenic. The Eastern Cape offers beautiful coastal scenery and unspoilt sandy beaches, and the region has many fascinating small towns, including Grahamstown and Hoff Rene, while the Karoo Heartland is dominated by endless flat plains, rocky mountains, and the biggest assortment of succulents in the world. The Eastern Cape is full of history and culture, from the early settlers who moved up from the Cape and settled in farming communities around Grahamstown, to the rich coarser culture that still thrives in the small rural villages along the wild coast. Several South African politicians also hail from the region, and the Eastern Cape was the birthplace of Nelson Mandela, Steve Biku, Oliver Tambo, and Thabo Mbeki. The Eastern Cape is also well known for its variety of malaria-free Big Five game reserves. The Eastern Cape borders the Garden Route of Titsakama and stretches northeastwards towards KwaZulu-Natal. With a large network of roads, self-driving in the Eastern Cape is a great option for those more adventurous travellers and is a natural extension for those self-driving in the Garden Route. While the cities of Port Elizabeth and East London are both serviced daily, with flights arriving from and departing to Cape Town, Johannesburg and Durban, making the region easily accessible from all the major centres. As the invite for the webinar mentioned, the sales and product team spent some time exploring the Eastern Cape earlier this year. We were together for the beginning of the trip and then split up, with Scott, Gary and I going inland to explore Hafrené and the Karoo, while Janae, Faith and Craig travelled to some of the coastal towns to explore the magnificent coastline and beaches and what they have to offer travellers. These two routes make excellent additions to clients' itineraries, especially for those who are visiting the Eastern Cape Game Reserves and for clients who are wanting to dig a bit deeper under the skin of South Africa. While there are many reasons to visit the Eastern Cape for a safari, some of our top reasons have to include that the Eastern Cape is one of the most ecologically diverse regions in the world. The Eastern Cape is malaria-free and therefore an ideal choice for family-friendly safaris, and the region is home to some of South Africa's top safari lodges. Travellers can enjoy the wonderful combination of a bush and beach holiday, and as already mentioned, the Eastern Cape is easily accessible and has a lovely subtropical climate with mild winters between May and September and warm summers between October and April. The Eastern Cape offers a wide range of vegetation and reserves. The Addo Elephant National Park has a few private concessions, while most of the private reserves have been formed from reclaimed farmland and have a focus on the conservation of their area and re-establishing the landscape back to its original state. Shamwari is the oldest of the private reserves and Kwandwe is the largest. Some lodges are located closer to the coast and have great river frontage, as well as access to nearby beaches for day trips. The different ecosystems allow for a wide variety of wildlife and bird life. The savannah grassland has a high carrying capacity and is able to sustain truly vast herds of plains game like zebra, impala and wildebeest, which in turn allows the reserves to sustain predators such as lion, leopards and cheetah. The subtropical thicket provides browsing for the elephant and the black rhino, while hippos can be found in the riverine habitats. Wildlife found on the reserves include the Big Five, cheetah, brown hyena and jackal, African wildcats, a variety of plains game, and the reserves are a paradise for bird watchers. Many of the reserves have conservation projects. For example, Kwandwe has established a breeding refuge for the blue crane. Black rhino have been reintroduced to their area as well as cheetah. More unusual species, such as the African wild cat and art fox, can also be spotted. The reintroduced red-billed oxpeckers are a common sight on buffaloes and rhinos and giraffes, and the flightless dung beetle, which is unique to the Eastern Cape, is another conservation success story of the region. The Eastern Cape safari lodges are often not your usual traditional safari lodges, like those found in the Sabi Sands. The lodges are often more reminiscent of the settlers' era, and many of the old farm buildings have been converted to form a part of the lodges. 
Longni Manor at Shamwari is very much in the style of the boutique hotel, while Kwanwe's Great Fish Lodge is modern and contemporary. Lalibela's Kachaka Lodge is stone and thatch, Kariha's Safari Lodge offers log chalets, while the River Lodge suites are thatched. A huge variety of different accommodation styles are available, and there are a number of lodges to book, from the more budget right up to the most luxurious. Activities at the lodges include morning and evening safari drives, and some lodges offer additional activities such as bushwalks and fishing. Quite a few of the Eastern Cape lodges have a luxury tented camp option, and these include Shamari's new Sindili camp, which opened in December last year. Complete with air conditioning, private decks with heated plunge pools, these tents are glamping at its very best. Other lodges which offer tented accommodation include Shamari's Bayeti and Gore Elephant Camp, which is on a concession in the heart of the Addo National Park. More budget-conscious tented camp options include Abacala's Quartermain and Woodbury Tented Camp. As the Eastern Cape is malaria-free, it offers an ideal destination for families wanting to go on safari. Two of the lodges which offer really fantastic kids programs are Shamwari River Dean and Kwandwe Eka Lodge. River Dean has recently been renovated and the Shamwari's Kids on Safari Adventure Center has a host of things specially designed for kids, including playground activities for younger kids and toddlers, a maze, zip line, rock climbing walls, and a network of tree houses connected by suspended walkways, a kids library, arts and crafts activities, pizza making and cookie decoration, all of which are perfect distractions for kids and tweens. Just to note that at Shamwari, kids under the age of four are not permitted on game drives. However, a child minding service is available at an additional cost. Children of all ages are welcome at Eka Lodge, and the lodge is ideal for families with younger children. Families are accommodated in one of the lodge's three family suites and included in the rate is a private vehicle, ranger, and tracker. The lodge has a playroom area with games and interactive activities, and the kitchen caters for children with cooking and baking classes between safari activities. Childminders are available at no additional cost, and the lodge is fenced. Families can participate in fun and adventurous activities on the reserve, including kite building, scavenger hunts, making molds of animal footprints, beading, and fishing trips with a ranger. The Eastern Cape Lodges also offer some great exclusive use options for multi-generational families traveling together, or for small groups looking for exclusive use accommodation. Shamwari Sirili Lodge offers an exclusive tailor-made experience for up to 10 guests. Kwandwe's modern and elegant fort house sleeps up to eight people. Upland's homestead, which is a colonial style farmhouse, dating from 1905, sleeps up to six. While Melton Manor is in the style of a contemporary frontier farmhouse and sleeps up to eight. Other exclusive use lodges in the area include Nzolo, which sleeps up to eight, Founders Lodge, which is a characterful 1940s farmhouse sleeping 12, Kariha Homestead, which sleeps up to 14, Long Hope Villa at Riverbend Lodge, and Lully Bella's Mills Manor. Many of the reserves and lodges offer short bushwalks as an activity. However, Shamwari offers a two-night trails experience at their explorer's camp. The camp is a wilderness bush camp which operates on either a Tuesday and a Wednesday or a Friday and a Saturday with an optional third night on request. The camp is only in operation between October and May. Explorer's Camp is discreetly fenced, but remains a true explorer ambiance and is located in a magical setting on the reserve and guests will explore trails from the camp. Guests are guided by qualified walking guides and the distances walked will vary each day, but can last up to about four hours. A game viewing vehicle remains in camp and will be utilized depending on where guests walk that day. The trail may start from camp or depart camp by vehicle to visit another area of the reserve. An easy two hours drive from the game region of the Eastern Cape is the quaint town of Graf Rene. 
Known as the Gem of the Karoo, Krafrenay is the oldest town in the Karoo and the fourth oldest in South Africa. The historic small town has over 200 buildings that have been recognized as national monuments and the town has retained much of the character typical of a 19th century town. Surrounded by the Camdenbury National Park and lying in a horseshoe shaped bend on the Sundays River, visitors will definitely not be short of things to do and see. Easily navigated by foot, Graf René's wide streets beg to be explored, while the Hrutkerk, or Big Church, commands full attention on the main road, and a few museums, coffee shops, and quaint houses with an attractive mix of Cape Dutch, Karoo, and Victorian architecture line the streets. Exploring Graf René by foot with a local expert gives you such a great feeling for this small town, and it's always lovely to hear an insider's knowledge of their own town. Our walk was filled with a mixture of history of the town and the Karoo, stories about the present and the past inhabitants, a look at some local landmarks and a visit to one of the local museums. Our walk was fascinating and we'd really recommend this for guests staying in Crofrenay. A scenic wonder, the Valley of Destination is made up of sheer cliffs and precariously balanced columns of dolerite, which rise up 120 metres from the valley floor. These columns of rock are set against the timeless backdrop of the plains of the Karoo and were created by both volcanic and erosive forces which have taken place over a hundred millions of years. The Valley of Desolation provides dramatic scenery, especially at sunset, together with a bird's eye view of the town and the surrounding plains. The Drusty. The Drusty was originally built in the 1800s and this unique hotel remains true to its roots, despite the modern touches. Rooms are on the ground level and maintain the character of the original buildings. With whitewashed walls and colourful accents around the doors and window frames, the Drusty must really be one of the prettiest hotels that we've seen. With a main swimming pool, a fine dining restaurant, a spa and a wine shop on site, the Drusty Hotel is a perfect stopover for those wishing to explore a bit more of the fascinating Karoo region. The rooms and suites are for all the modern touches that one would expect, including air conditioning for the warmer summer days and underfloor heating and heated towel rails for the crisper winters. The hotel supports the South African College for Tourism and the restaurant is staffed with some of the students. It was really great to be able to chat to some of the dynamic young students who have such a passion for tourism in South Africa. Less than an hour's drive from Graf René and about two and a half hours from Port Elizabeth, Samara spans over 27,000 hectares of wilderness. The conservation success story, Samara is focused on rewilding the Great Karoo and the owners are actively restoring and rehabilitating the land. The reserve now is the first cheetah in 125 years, the first elephant in the area in 150 years and the first lion in 180 years. With two lodges on the reserve, there are only ever a maximum of 26 guests on the property. Comprising of Karoo Lodge and the Manor House, guests have a choice of accommodation options and the four bedroom Manor House can be booked for an exclusive use stay. Samara offers a range of experiences for guests, including wilderness picnics, dinners under the stars, walking safaris, and cheetah trekking, which we were able to experience as a part of our afternoon safari drive. Trekking these beautiful animals on foot with an experienced ranger was a first for us, and it was really special to be able to watch quietly as they lazed in the late afternoon sunshine. Highlights of our stay were both the dramatic landscapes and the beautiful scenery, together with the warm and engaging staff, elegant decor, and satisfying home-style meals. Samara offers a guided bushwalk and fly camp sleep out as an additional activity for guests who are staying for three or more nights. Guests will enjoy an afternoon guided bushwalk with their ranger and tracker before arriving at their private camp at dusk. The fly camp is available between October and May. Thank you, Megs. Hi, everyone. As Megan mentioned, Craig, Faith and I took to the road to explore some of the coastal villages and towns along the Eastern Cape coastline. 
and I'm going to briefly touch on some of the highlights of our journey along the Sunshine Coast. The Sunshine Coast stretches for 500 kilometers along the coastline from Sitsikama to East London and is said to get more hours of sunlight than the rest of South Africa, about 320 out of 365 days a year. This section of coastline is a great option for those who enjoy nature, history and culture. It is also worth noting that it is said to be one of the mildest areas during the South African winter months, with daytime temperatures averaging around 21 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Kenton-on-Sea is a small coastal town situated midway between Port Elizabeth and East London, approximately 90 minutes from Port Elizabeth, one hour 40 minutes from East London, 20 minutes from Port Alfred, and 40 minutes from the history-rich town of Grahamstown. So, you might wonder what makes Kenton-on-Sea so special. Well, there are a couple of reasons. Firstly, it is perfectly situated, hemmed in on either side by the Kariga and Bushman River estuaries and the warm Indian Ocean, so the landscape and scenery is simply breathtaking. This, combined with wonderful, secluded and safe beaches, make it the ideal family destination and it's equally well suited to couples seeking a romantic beach escape. More importantly, it lacks the overt commercialization that many similar sized towns have experienced in the past few years. In fact, outside of the inevitably busy December season, it is a beach paradise with a small selection of shops and restaurants just to give it that distinctive seaside buzz. There is a variety of big five reserves for day tripping within close proximity to Kenton. Subuya is the easiest and accessible with Addo, Shamwari and Kariga Game Reserve also within easy reach. Our first stop in Kenton on Sea took us to the house quarters. This little gem is situated in the heart of Kenton on Sea and has been designed by a local architect and finished to a high standard. The new boutique style development comprises of seven neat and functional apartments, sleeping two to four guests depending on the unit. The overriding style here is contemporary and modern, with views of the Kriga River mouth and beaches peeking through the shrubbery from some of the balconies. The house quarters is well priced for the quality of the offering and the standard of the units, and it is well located, only a 10 minute walk from the beach. The Oyster Box Beach House by the Oyster Collection is just a short, short distance from house quarters and is located 500 metres from Kariga Beach, taking prime location in this unique seaside town known for its beach, bush, river and lagoon frontage. When Louise Poole opened Oyster Box Beach House, she raised the bar and with each successive house, the collection now comprises various options dotted around the village, she has maintained pole possession, offering the best equipped, most luxurious villas in Kenton-on-Sea. Oyster Box Beach House is the flagship and the only property with uninterrupted lagoon and sea views. The beach house features two luxury suites available on an individual b, &B basis and is also available as an exclusively yours villa rental with two additional rooms downstairs. The house strikes the perfect balance between luxury and laid back. Large comfy sofas invite you to put your feet up and there are sheltered courtyards and alcoves for quiet seclusion. The decor and prevailing design is fresh, airy and beachy and the house is presided over by a super efficient team. The next stop on our itinerary took us to Port Alfred, situated at the mouth of the Kawi River, almost exactly midway between Port Elizabeth in the west and East London in the east. It too boasts fabulous beaches that stretch for many kilometers in both directions. The popular holiday destination was once an important river port with tall masted sailing ships mooring at the wharf. When dredging the Kawi River became too expensive, 
smaller fishing vessels dominated the port until local fishing quotas were awarded elsewhere. These days, boating for pleasure and sport on the 22 kilometers of navigable river is where the action is. Wharf Street has become a small waterfront attraction with its own microbrewery, restaurants, a tiny theater, antiques and collectible sh shops, and of course, your typical fish and chips shop. Traveling further along the Sunshine Coast from Kenton, Oceana Beach is situated nine kilometers east of Port Alfred on the R72, overlooking the Indian Ocean. Spectacular and unique, Oceana offers a coastal luxury boutique hotel experience. The property is perfectly poised within a sprawling 740 hectare wildlife sanctuary, fronted by a pristine seven kilometer stretch of beach. It is the only wildlife reserve located on the beach in South Africa, and the surrounding landscape is just picture perfect. Supremely spacious with an expansive footprint, the lodge is housed under thatch and has been designed to take full advantage of the captivating views of sand and sea framed by indigenous shrubs and trees. Oceana offers three lodge suites and four ocean suites. And here we recommend the latter ocean suites for its comfort and space. These freestanding units are dotted amongst the trees and feature a spacious lounge that opens onto a generous private wooden deck, providing a 180 degree view of ocean and reserve. The lodge has the ambience and design of a completely traditional colonial safari style lodge. With a welcoming lounge and dining area, which spills out onto a spacious deck overlooking the ocean. Exciting news is that Oceana will soon launch new ocean suites set further away from the main lodge and directly positioned to take advantage of the location. This will elevate the accommodation offering and bring more of a contemporary decor and style to the property. Last, but not least, our final stop on our trip, because Kinsa, a village in the Wild Coast region of the Eastern Cape, situated 38 kilometers northeast from East London at the mouth of the Tunsa River, with a clear 15 kilometer stretch of beach, natural forest, exciting outdoor adventures, cultural encounters, and again, largely undeveloped, Tunsa is recognized as one of South Africa's prime coastal destinations. It's the perfect chill out hideaway for travelers of all ages, and it was a highlight of our coastal road trip. For those of you who are wondering, Tunsa is a Kosa word meaning river of crumbling banks and is apparently pronounced in a very specific way. Many visitors say Sinsa or Shinsa, but the locals introduce a click sound at the beginning of the word, which I've yet to fully master. Prana Lodge is situated in a pristine dune forest along the spectacular Tsunsa Bay, approximately two hours, 30 minutes from Sibuya and two hours, 40 minutes from Kariga Private Game Reserve. This small luxury hotel has the distinct and unique ambience of a tropical beach retreat and is the perfect coastal extension to relax and unwind pre or post an Eastern Cape Safari. Characterized by polished floors, white walls, exposed beams, and big furniture, a private collection of art by local artists, Persian carpets, and an eclectic assortment of fixtures and fittings, Prana's overall design is influenced by Eastern architecture with a strong African bias. The suites at Prana Lodge are lovely, and while the color of each room differs with, for example, ruby dominated by a series of reds, the overall look of the suites is styled very much like the main hotel. Its wood floors broken up by rug, rugs, the walls unapologetically white, and a spacious lounge area. The Diamond Villa, which is the presidential suite, boasts wonderful sea views. It is a great stop as a romantic getaway for couples and honeymooners. And another and unexpected highlight was the food. Headed up by Chef JC Ferreira, Dishes are inspired by his travels to Asia, Europe, and across the African continent, and everything is local, fresh, and beautifully plated. 
whilst the bulk of the suites are set within a forest-like setting and don't overlook the ocean. Prana's piece de resistance is its exquisite setting within a 21 kilometer stretch of uninterrupted pristine beach, a short trot over the dunes. For Prana, we were fortunate to join local guide Khalile on a closer cultural experience. Whilst many travellers inherently associate the Eastern Cape with the late great Nelson Mandela, a trip with Valile and Imonti tours opens up a beautiful window into some of the other treasures the province hold. Valile's Xhosa experience includes a visit to a typical rural Xhosa village and seeks to use these local living villages as a host community, giving a peek into the daily life of South African Xhosa culture to learn about its heritage and traditions. The Xhosa people emphasize traditional practices and customs inherited from their forefathers. Each person within Xhosa culture has his or own place, which is recognized by the entire community. And despite the overwhelming influence of Western culture, many villagers still practice their traditions. This experience weaves storytelling with dance and singing, and touches on local customs, ceremonies, and attire, and the roles of the elders within the community. Historically, homesteads or Nimizi of the Glossa culture are scattered over the rural landscape of the Eastern Cape. And we learnt about these dwellings, the local craft of beading and weaving, and enjoyed a traditional meal. Belile is an affable, professional, and engaging guide and his spirit and enthusiasm is infectious. During our brief encounter, it was clear that he holds a great respect for his community and people, and this is reciprocated by those we encountered along the way. Thank you for listening. I'm now going to hand you over back to Megan, and I will join you after for Q&As. Thank you, Thanks so much, Janae. Moving on to the city of Port Elizabeth. Often overlooked, but really well worth visiting. The city was named not after a queen, but after the deceased wife of the acting governor of the Cape Colony, who had been tasked to look after the 1820 British settlers. Heartbroken at her death, he named the city in her honor, and you can visit the pyramid that he built to commemorate her at the Duncan Lighthouse in the heart of the city. Other little known facts include that Port Elizabeth Algoa Bay is the bottlenose dolphin capital of the world and has an estimated 20,000 dolphins inhabiting the bay. It is also home to the largest breeding colony of African penguins. The warm waters are rich in marine life and there's no better way to get up close and personal with the whales, dolphins and Cape fur seals than through an expertly guided boat cruise. Nature lovers can spend a morning out at the Cape Reef Reserve for some interesting shoreline ecology, visiting the third oldest operational lighthouse in South Africa. Also visited during this guided tour is Samarek, a marine and penguin rehabilitation center dedicated to the rescue and the release of injured marine animals and birds. Port Elizabeth has 40 kilometers of pristine city coastline and has some standout local beaches. Warm water and a protected bay make for safe swimming, and popular choices include Hobie Beach and local favourite King's Beach, which comes alive on the weekend with market stalls and traders. Another great option is a three-hour walking tour of Route 67. This route marks the number of years Mandela dedicated to the freedom struggle, which is commemorated through a series of 67 artworks by local Eastern Cape artists. You will meander your way from the Campanile, which marks the spot where the 1820 settlers landed, through the city and up the steps to the massive South African flag at the Duncan Reserve. Best done as a guided tour, it's a great way to learn about key historical sites while showcasing some unique artworks. That's pretty much the Eastern Cape in a nutshell. Please look out for our product reports on the Agent Zone and please send through any questions now.